And now we will turn to Latin America. And I'm pleased to present, if I can get this up, um, the, here we go, the um, issues around leadership and governance in Latin America and the Caribbean region. And I'm Silvana Luciani, by the way, I should introduce myself, right? I'm Silvana Luciani, I'm an advisor in, in the non-communicable disease program at the Pan American Health Organization, and I work uh, very closely with countries throughout Latin America and the Caribbean with the ministries of health in helping to strengthen their cervical cancer screening programs. So in the next 15 minutes, I will briefly review the issue of leadership and governance for cervical cancer in the region and some of the progress that's being made with introducing HPV testing as well as strengthening cytology programs which continue to be the standard in many countries in this region um, and then talk a little bit about the support that we're providing at PAHO. And just to remind everybody that the region of Latin America and the Caribbean has some of the highest rates of cervical cancer around the world. There's some 68,000 women who are newly diagnosed each year and some 31,000, more than 31,000 women who die from this disease, which is largely preventable. So this is a real shame, especially in this day when we have the available technology and the tools. So when we talk about leadership and governance for cervical cancer screening, what we're talking about is creating that leadership and organizing those programs to help reduce some of these inequities in health and really creating that leadership base in those countries that do have some of the highest rates, which also tend to be some of the poorer countries and those countries that are dealing with the double burden of infectious diseases, high maternal mortality, high infant mortality ratios. So it's a very complex situation. And when Mona and Eduardo first asked me to talk about leadership and governance in this region, I thought, well, what does that exactly mean? So I turned to the UNFPA guidance document, which was the basis for designing this workshop, and, um, and came up with these six points of what it means to have leadership and governance in the program. The first is that the program should be based um, within a Ministry of Health, public health program. So it should have um, sort of the universal coverage and universality that comes along with Ministry of Health publicly funded public health programs and that there should be a sufficient resource base within the national program to be able to deliver the services within that program. Secondly, that the health services associated with the screening program should be an essential part of the routine health service delivery. So universal coverage and access uh, with a focus on providing services at the primary level of health care but having those strong linkages between primary health care, secondary level care, and tertiary care, and ensuring that the screening is actually linked to the treatment, because in fact, what will reduce mortality is the treatment, not simply the screening. And engaging all levels of the health sector and all stakeholders that have an interest and a, a role to play in cervical cancer through the creation of, for example, multidisciplinary and multi-agency task forces. And then what should be governing this program is a normative framework, so norms, guidelines that have been set by the professional associations with consensus and buy-in from the providers as well as from the Ministry of Health, the funders of the program. And that this normative guideline should include the technologies that are currently available for screening but also take into consideration the future availability of um, screening tests. So make plans so that every few years the guidelines don't need to be revised but that, that there is this normative standard being applied universally throughout the health system. Um, and fifth, that the program includes a target population of women who are at high risk and that it is critically important that within this normative framework and these guidelines that that target population is identified and that there is a buy-in from the providers that this is really the target age group because when there are limited resources that cannot be applied applied um, to the entire population, of course, it is, um, it will have the greater impact by focusing on the target age group and achieving high coverage in that target age group. And lastly, of course, leveraging resources from all stakeholders because recognizing that no one institution or no one body can achieve um, the impact of cervical cancer uh, mortality reductions unless there's coordination among the various players in health systems, which often include um, in Latin America and the Caribbean, not only the Ministry of Health, but the social security system, the private system, et cetera. And so to answer the question of um, where are countries in Latin America at with points number one, two, and three, I turned to a survey that we did just earlier this year with those program managers who are leading 
programs at the national level for cervical cancer and cancer in general. So the survey was conducted earlier this year with every single program manager in the ministries of health in all the countries within the Latin American Caribbean region. So these are the people in the ministries who are responsible for managing programs. And when asked whether or not they had a national cancer plan, the majority of countries that responded reported having a national plan and that those that did have a plan, over half of them report having a sufficient budget to be able to implement the plan. Um, and again, a majority noting that they systematically monitor and evaluate this plan. And in terms of screening services, all countries or all, the majority of countries report having cervical cytology services in place and that the majority of those services are offered free of charge to women, thus reducing some of the barriers to access. Um, and for HPV DNA testing, seven countries report having the service available, although we know that there are two countries that have introduced it on a national scale as part of their national public health programs, but several other countries in the region are introducing it on a pilot level or through research projects. And with VIA, um, again, several countries in the country introducing it as part of national programs and several others introducing it on a pilot scale or through research projects. Um, and colposcopy, that is the diagnostic service level, everybody reporting access and availability. Chemotherapy, a large portion of uh, responders noting availability for chemotherapy um, and less availability for radiotherapy, which tends to be concentrated in the capital cities, so access to radiotherapy and cancer treatment continues to be a challenge in the region, and as well as with oral morphine. And then to answer the questions around normative guidelines and where countries in the region are at with normative guidelines, I turned again to another survey that we had done recently with the cervical cancer program managers in the region. And you'll see just uh, a listing of some of the countries that I've reported here, along with their incidence and mortality rates. Um, all countries have national level screening guidelines that are based on, I have to say, a lot of them look towards the, um, the United States and the US Preventive Task Force um, as providing overall guidance and as well as to the WHO recommendations on guidance for screening but each one of them sets their own national guidelines and you'll see variations of target age group in these screening guidelines um, some of them starting as young as 25 but several countries moving to older age groups for initiating screening and of course, the um, estimates for coverage of these current screening programs vary from a low of about 20% to around 50% or as high as 70% in some of those countries that have been successful in achieving a higher coverage. So overall, on paper, I think we would grade the Latin America and Caribbean region a B or B plus in terms of their leadership and governance and screening programs. But that's what it looks like on paper, right? Because we know that the reality is that especially in the past 10 years, most of the countries in the region have not been able to successfully reduce mortality rates. It's about uh, less than 1% uh, reduction in mortality over the past two years. But Chile is our poster child for achieving significant reductions in mortality as a result of amplifying the leadership and governance in their national program. So Chile has made significant investments in organizing the service of offering cytology screening on a national level ensuring that there's a call and recall system in place, inviting the target population age group, putting in place strong quality assurance, quality control in the cytology labs, ensuring and following up that women with abnormal screening results do get treatment, and that has shown some payoffs. And so in recognition of, of some of these difficulties in Latin America and the Caribbean with leadership and governance, we've been able to identify some of the main barriers to effective programs, one being around the program organization and those health system barriers. Oops, it has a mind of its own. Um, the program organization and those health system barriers that prevent access to services, for example, the location of the clinics, the screening hours, um, a lot of the limitations with male providers and women preferring female providers, and all of the program organization that's needed to call women, invite women, know who your target age group is, to be able to do the monitoring and evaluation, to have the cancer registries and information systems in place to allow organized delivery of screening services and monitoring the impact of those screening services. And of course, the second barrier is the limitation of cytology. We've heard 
learned throughout this workshop that cytology at its best is around 50% sensitivity. Well, in low resource settings, that sensitivity is decreased. And you'll see in the next slide some of the results of, of research in our, our region showing lower than 50% sensitivity, which requires repeat testing. And as well, there's limitations with cytology because of the infrastructural requirements. And often pap tests are taken, many pap tests are taken in countries throughout the region. And those pap tests will sit in the lab for several months, delaying the results, reducing the confidence that women have that these screening services are actually yielding any, any results for them. Um, and then this is related to the last barrier uh, around social cultural issues. There's very low awareness of cervical cancer as a priority public health issue among providers, but among women themselves. Um, the concept of seeking health services when you're feeling fine, there's no symptoms, there's no signs of illness, uh, is not a habitual practice. And so we need to address some of the women's perceptions, the misbeliefs, help reduce some of those health system barriers that improve access. And all of this in the context of organized programs that achieve high screening coverage, complete follow-up care, and quality of services. And the region has led the way in terms of screening test studies. Um, here is a sampling of the numerous studies taking place in the region over the past several years, looking at the alternative screening tests, HPV DNA testing, PAP examining the cytology, sensitivity and specificity and performance in the Latin America Caribbean region in our context, as well as VIA testing. So we have um, studies such as the LAM study in, uh, that cover populations in Argentina and Brazil. We have other studies in Brazil, Chile, Colombia, the Guanacaste study supported by the US government and the NCI in Costa Rica, Morales study, Tati, you see we like to name our studies. Um, and these studies all cover tremendous amounts of populations of women, and all showing the same thing. HPV DNA testing has superior sensitivity and specificity. Some of the studies have included self-sampling, um, and you'll see the sensitivity and specificity is a little bit lower in self-sampling, but still very acceptable, especially when you compare with PAP, and in some regions, a very low sensitivity of PAP testing and VIA performing equal to, or in some cases, better than PAP. So of course, it's not just the screening test that makes a difference in a screening program. It's having that all those pieces of the process of care from community mobilization to enrolling women to providing quality testing and providing treatment for those women that require it. And so as we look forward, um, we look to each of the countries in the region, and I just want to highlight some of the leaders in each of the sub-regions of, uh, of Latin America and the Caribbean to highlight where some of the leadership is coming from and which programs are actually um, paving the way for the region in terms of introducing HPV testing and exploring introduction of VIA and cryotherapy treatment. In Central America, we have the benefit of having several countries, around seven countries, who cooperate under the umbrella of um, a Central America Ministerial Commission. And that Central America Ministerial Commission created a resolution for cancer prevention and control. So raise the political profile of cancer at the sub-regional level of Central America. And this has spurred a lot of changes in the national policies and programs for cancer in general, but for cervical cancer in specific. And El Salvador is leading the way with testing care HPV, um, and that's being led by an NGO, Basic Health International, with um, working very closely and arm in arm with the Ministry of Health, um, as well as rolling out VIA testing. Um, Nicaragua is also testing out CARE HPV DNA testing in their national program, again with the assistance of PATH, PATH who's working very closely arm in arm with the Ministry of Health. And so these two countries through their demonstration projects and their testing of using CARE HPV are helping create that foundation, that knowledge and that evidence base of uh, how feasible it is to do HPV testing in these contexts and in these settings and um, what some of the costs and challenges and barriers and what some of the lessons are so that we can scale up and amplify further to the region. And of course, to the north of Central America is Mexico, which is like the big brother to Central America. Um, and they're leading the way with HPV DNA testing, having introduced it uh, more than two years ago. And they started delivering HPV DNA testing to the poorest 125 municipalities. So taking a high risk targeted approach in those communities where access to screening was limited, and they've now since scaled up to the national level. So again, Mexico being a strong leader in HPV testing in the region and providing 
a strong evidence base and information on how to do it at a larger scale than what's being done in some of these smaller countries in Central America. In the Caribbean, again, we have a series of small islands um, that have a natural history of working together under the rubric of CARICOM. And under CARICOM, a Caribbean Cervical Cancer Initiative was started about six or seven years ago. Jamaica is leading the way, having done some HPV prevalence studies, going through the um, collection of information to allow decisions around HPV vaccine introduction as well as HPV DNA testing. So we're looking towards Jamaica for soon to introduce testing of um, HPV as part of their national screening program. And Trinidad and Tobago is also in the moments of considering that. And then we have Guyana and Suriname that's working very closely with several of the NGOs um, with VIA testing. And in South America, we have several countries who have introduced HPV DNA testing um, at, uh, as part of the national program. Argentina is leading the way. And again, they've begun a phased introduction of HPV testing, starting with the poorest region in the north of the country. Um, and starting to show some early results of excellent coverage, excellent acceptability by providers and by women. And again, helping create that foundation of lessons learned for HPV DNA testing in the South America context. And we have our colleagues in Colombia who presented earlier today on some of the experiences with HPV testing there in Colombia. And I have to say, South America is now organizing themselves around a network for cancer control, convening all the heads of the National Cancer Institutes under the name of RINC. Redes de Institutos Nacionales de Cancer. And this network of collaboration around Central, um, uh, around South America has created this South-South collaboration. So now countries like Argentina are providing support to Bolivia. Brazil is providing support to other neighboring countries. And so I think we're going to see a lot more collaboration between countries, especially in South America, with the creation of this network. And at PAHO, what we've been trying to do is to help um, stimulate some of this leadership and help institute some of this governance that's required for screening programs by disseminating the knowledge base, by bringing people together in workshops and in meetings and sharing experiences. And there's tremendous value in having people meet each other, having people talk about some of the logistical challenges of introducing HPV testing at a national level or through demonstration projects. PAHO sometimes gets criticized for having too many meetings, but I have to say that when you're introducing new technologies and innovations are required, the value of sharing this on a personal level and making those connections and seeking the support of neighboring countries is really critical. And so I just um, want to say maybe qualitatively there have been some significant advances in screening programs, much more community awareness, um, greater ability of providers, more women being screened, and as well as uh, improvements to the health systems and services like radiotherapy to provide treatment for women. And I just want to conclude by saying that the Latin American Caribbean region is really at a tipping point. And I think really what we need now is just to apply all of the evidence, apply all the tools through concerted, coordinated efforts and sharing resources among all the players from academia, civil society, private sector, international organizations to really give the push it needs to help kind of overcome the hump and really see some accelerations in reduction of cervical cancer mortality. So thank you. <laughs>